Break out the cake and ice cream, everybody, and say happy birthday to our awareness that the Bush administration listened in on our phone calls without the constitutionally mandated warrants. Yes, today is the third birthday of this New York Times story. Dateline, Washington, December 15th, 2005. The first story to expose the NSA's warrantless wiretapping program, the one where the government listens to calls made by American citizens without the court approval we all thought they needed to do stuff like that. When the story first broke three years ago, President Bush assured us he was only spying on bad people. If somebody from Al-Qaeda is calling you, we'd like to know why. This is a limited program designed to prevent attacks on the United States of America. Of course, that line of reasoning kind of fell apart when a second round of NSA whistleblowers emerged. Rather than targeting military entities in the Middle East, we were actually listening to a lot of everyday ordinary people um, the, who really, in many ways, had absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. But the president's other mantra in the wake of the wiretapping story was designed to cast the original whistleblower and the reporters who made his concerns public as enemies of our national security. It was a shameful act for someone to disclose this very important program in time of war. The, the fact that we're discussing this program is uh, helping the enemy. Helping the enemy? So being a whistleblower is not easy, it is not fun, and frankly, it's not all that safe. U.S. Army Specialist Joseph Darby, the man who turned in the photos of prisoners being abused at Abu Ghraib, he had to be flown out of Iraq on an hour's notice and moved immediately away from his hometown. Joseph Wilson, the former ambassador who debunked the uranium in Africa claim from the Bush administration's case for invading Iraq, the same Joe Wilson who wrote about his findings in the New York Times and accused the Bush administration of twisting intelligence, well, now we all know the name and face of his wife, who used to be a covert CIA officer before she was outed by the Bush administration. Those are the ones we know about, where the retribution was public and obvious. So what about the NSA wiretapping whistleblower, the one President Bush accused of committing a shameful act and helping the enemy? We now know that man was Thomas Tam, a former Justice Department lawyer who first called the New York Times from a subway phone booth to tell them about the NSA's illegal spying program. Mr. Tam revealed himself as the whistleblower this week to Newsweek's investigative correspondent and our frequent guest, Michael Isakoff. And tonight, for the first time on television, he is here to talk to us about what made him become a whistleblower and what has happened to him since. Joining us now is Thomas Tam, former prosecutor, former Justice Department official. Mr. Tam, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I know you come from a, a long line of Tams who have served law enforcement. Your father and your uncle were senior FBI officials. Your brother was an FBI agent. Uh, you yourself a prosecutor, a Department of Justice official. What was the tipping point for you? What made you feel like you needed to tell the press about this secret program? Well, it was a number of things. I. Um I had the privilege and honor of meeting with the 9-11 victim families when I was with the uh, Capital Case Unit in the Department of Justice uh, preparing for the prosecution of Massawi, and they were really inspirational. And I also, as a result of that case, uh, had the opportunity to review documents, CIA cables at the uh, CIA. And I learned that we were uh, secretly rendering uh, suspects, people to uh, states that would likely torture them. I heard my government say that we were not doing that and that we would never do that. And I just uh, ended up feeling like uh, I was aware. I, my entire life really was based on trying to enforce the law, my entire career. And I believed that the law was being broken in the uh, place where I was working. I was struck the way that Michael Isakoff wrote about the discussions of illegality in your, in your workplace. He described uh, a senior counsel in your office uh, telling you that she assumed that some of the activity happening through the NSA was illegal. The deputy counsel told you that the attorney general might end up getting indicted because of the program. Um, but they, they didn't speak up. I imagine that must have been very difficult in the office to have people acknowledging overtly that there was illegal activity happening, but nobody was willing to publicly come out about it. It was very difficult, and, and I don't mean to, I mean, they are really fine uh, public servants that work in OIPR where I was, and I do believe that lawfully they help keep our country safe from terrorists and from uh, foreign 
intelligence like uh, Russia or th that we traditionally uh, surveilled. Um, but it, I mean, it just it just struck me. I said, wait a second. We assume that what they're doing is illegal. I don't understand that. Why do we, why are we part of that? Are we aiding and abetting the violation of a of a crime? I just I was stunned. Uh, when I heard that uh, something had from this special program may have gotten into a regular FISA warrant and learned that for the first time ever that a sitting uh, attorney general was going to be indicted. And when I was told that, I was thinking, well, wasn't John Mitchell indicted when he was sitting? But then I just stepped back and said, this is crazy. This is not what the Department of Justice is all about. This is not what the Constitution is about. I remember when I w was figuring out that something was going on uh, extrajudicially, I looked at the NSA websites and they proudly talked about the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, the right of the people to be secure in their persons and their places, and that's, what we've, that's part of the reason that we fought the Revolutionary War. And then they took the Fourth Amendment down from their website, and we learned that the only way that we can be kept safe is for the government to break our laws. I just disagree with that. I think we are stronger and better as a nation when we follow the Constitution, when we follow the statutes, and when we follow the rule of law. Mr. Tam, when we think about trying to make the country whole again, when we think about trying to bring us back to um, those ideals that you're discussing with such passion, the idea of being a country that's ruled by law, as far as I understand it, the FISA Act establishes a five-year imprisonment penalty for having done surveillance without getting the appropriate permission from the FISA court. And that is what the NSA program was designed to do. And then there was whole other elements of it that were designed to cover up the fact that that's what the FISA program, what the NSA program was doing. Do you think in order to move forward and to, to pay tribute to the rule of law that there ought to be prosecutions? I certainly think it ought to be looked at. I mean, I really do. I, I've heard talk about a commission to try and determine the truth. Uh, and then I hear the flip side is that it's a, that what happened is in the past. Well, when I was a prosecutor, I'm pretty sure that every criminal case that I prosecuted had happened before I walked into that courtroom and stood before that jury and judge. I just, it, it, it uh, offends me that we feel uh, that we're not strong enough as a country, that our laws are not strong enough, that our Congress is not strong enough, that our courts are not strong enough to protect us. And I, I personally, I'm a prosecutor, although I'm a defense attorney at the moment, uh, I think it should be looked at very seriously. Thomas Tam, I know that um, this has been professionally and personally very difficult for you since you came out and did this. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for what you've done. Thank you.